picture again that reminds very much of the picture we saw this morning by Tom. Uh, we have at least um, in fluorescent OLED emitters, the idea is that you have fluorescence from the singlet excited state and you have a large um, energy separation between S1 and T1 and there is very little uh, inter-system crossing from the singlet to the triplet. As soon as you introduce a heavy transition metal like iridium, uh, you will get rather large inter-system crossing very fast, typically 10 to 11, 10 to 12 per second uh, from the S1 to the triplet and you very often see only phosphorescence. So it's very rarely seen that you see both fluorescence and phosphorescence. And for TADF, um, of course, the idea is that, that we uh, get only fluorescence and the singlet triplet level here is very small. So spin-forbidden transitions are essential in these cases. So spin-forbidden non-radiative transitions for coupling singlet and triplet and spin-forbidden radiative transitions here for getting these triplet states. And this is just some schematic. So the most important um, processes, excited state processes where you have uh, uh, a change of spin state are inter-system crossing, phosphorescence. Um, you can achieve that by spin-orbit coupling. You can also achieve that by electron spin-spin coupling. Electron spin-spin coupling is typically much, much, much smaller than spin-orbit coupling. However, and, and therefore we focus here on spin-orbit coupling, however, spin-spin coupling can couple singlets and triplets with equal spatial configuration. And I show you uh, in a minute the selection rules for spin-orbit coupling. This is not allowed for spin-orbit coupling. So there can be, so to say, spin-spin coupling can also couple uh, singlet and triplet states with equal configuration. So what is spin-orbit coupling about? Let's start from a semi-classical picture of spin-orbit coupling and the easiest picture that you can have is you have an electron and this electron moves around your nucleus and because this is an, a moving um, charge, you generate, uh, so to say, some magnetic moment associated with this motion. Here you have the angular momentum vector and um, because in the molecule we always sit, so to say, have your, our origin in the electron, um, this is equivalent to the charge the, the, the charged nucleus moving around the electron, you would say that's impossible, but these are completely equivalent descriptions. It just turns around the sign of your angular momentum. And this angular momentum, that couples to the intrinsic spin of the electron, and then uh, you get uh, an interaction, a semi-classical spin-orbit interaction energy, and that has some pre-factors here and you see that this depends on the, on the charge of the nucleus. It depends on the third um, power here of your distance between the electron and the um, nucleus and then you have here multiplied by um, the angular momentum and you have a scalar product with the spin momentum. And this 1 over R dependence, this makes spin-orbit coupling a very local property. Hmm? So you get the largest spin-orbit coupling if, if the electron is close to it. So if you then look at spin-orbit coupling in terms of um, a more quantitative uh, method, not the semi-classical picture. You see that in the Schrödinger equation here, 
you get a spin orbit coupling from the derivative of your electrostatic potential. And since your electrostatic potential um, is just the Coulomb attraction or the Coulomb repulsion between the electrons, you get this phi is then the uh, product over the charges over R and the derivative is again a function of um, 1 over R cubed times R. And the same, and then you can use this and you get again this angular momentum divided over R3. And if you put that, so to say, in the bright Pauli Hamiltonian, it looks messy, but it's actually not so complicated because the blue terms here, these are the derivatives of the electron nuclear attraction potential. So this is the Coulomb attraction. And then you have the momentum of the electron, the spin. And these are the two electron terms. And here is uh, the angular momentum of particle I interacting with the spin of particle I. Here you have uh, the angular momentum of particle J interacting with the spin of particle I. And here you have the, the reverse term. So what you get is you have a one electron term, you have the two electron spin same orbit term, this is this one, and this is called the two electron spin other orbit term. You can put these together and then you get a Hamiltonian of this type. And this Hamiltonian has one electron terms and two electrons. In heavy ele elements, this one electron term is, is dominant. So 90% of all the spin orbit coupling comes then from this one electron term. But if you go to um, organic compounds with carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, in this case, the two electron terms contribute approximately 50% to the spin orbit coupling. So they screen the uh, interaction. It's, it's similar to, to screening of uh, Coulomb interaction. So the two electron, the electron-electron repulsion terms coming from them, they screen the interaction with the nucleus. And when this is 50%, you cannot neglect this. Hmm? You might neglect this for 10% in platinum, it's fine. But, uh, 50% cannot be neglected, and if you go to even lighter elements, the two electron terms are dominant. So, what to do? These two electron contributions, they cannot be neglected, but you can treat them in a mean field manner. You can do something very similar to what you do in a Hartree-Fock interaction. You namely um, calculate the you average, so to say, over the interaction of the two electrons. This is done in this term. This is not important here for you. Um, you just sum up over all the um, inner shell electrons and the interactions, and then you get something which is called a spin orbit mean field Hamiltonian. Nevertheless, two electron integrals are expensive, and the spin orbit operator has Two com uh, three components, and also the particle symmetry is not uh, obeyed. So you have six times as many integrals as for uh, uh, an electron repulsion. So actually, you do not want to calculate all these integrals. Huh? And uh, then you can see that the largest screening terms, they stem from the inner shells, and these two electron Two, uh, one electron, two center terms, if you have one here, one here, they tend to cancel the two electron and the one electron. So what you actually do is you can, in a good approximation, neglect all the 
two center terms. So instead of calculating, for instance, this PTACH2 molecule, the integrals of that, you just disrupt your system and look only at one center term. And then you have atoms. So what you then do, and for atoms you can calculate integrals really fast. So in this case, you calculate the spin orbit integrals just in the atomic basis for every element. You, you can use spherical symmetry. And then you transform, you add all this up, and you transform it into your molecular basis. And um, then you get, this is what is called the atomic mean field approximation. Huh? This is an amphi um, is atomic mean field integral approximation. It's very good, or rather good, for um, heavy elements. Uh, and uh, you might have some errors for light element compounds, but uh, it is more or less the best approximation we can have if we just want to have a one electron approximation. There are other effective Hamiltonians. And the other effective Hamiltonians are often of this type. So you just have the L and S. And how do you get, so to say, the screening? And the screening in this case is done by uh, scaling down the nuclear charge. And this is actually an effective parameter. You cannot just say I, um, you, you fit this parameter to atomic spectra and then um, you can get, so to say, uh, here a semi-empirical spin orbit Hamiltonian. People often work with this kind of spin orbit Hamiltonian. You have to be careful with that. So it's quite okay for transition elements. It's very dangerous for uh, organic compounds. And you have to be very, very careful when you combine this kind of Hamiltonian with a pseudopotential for the um, transition element compounds, because in this case, you get really, really large values. For instance, for iridium, you get in this approximation something like uh, a nuclear charge of 1,200. Huh? Completely ridiculous. But this is because in the pseudopotential, you do not have um, an amplitude close to your nucleus. It's just a fit parameter. So, in most, it's better than to use uh, an operator for the effective core potentials, which is associated with the ECP you are using also for the scalar relativistic effects. And this has also this, ter this form. You do not have a 1 over 3 cubed dependence, but this can be handled, so to say, um, in this case. These are quite good, and the parameters are adjusted to orbital shapes or also to orbital energies of four component relativistic atomic calculations. And so there is, uh, for those who are interested, there is a review article where you can read everything about that. So, symmetry considerations. All these spin orbit operators can more or less be written in this way. And this is a phenom phenomenological spin orbit operator. <laughs> Not yet needed. <laughs> Properties. Um, it's good for symmetry selection rules. You can not use it in calculations. So, so the scalar product of L and S can be either written in Cartesian components, then you have here the X, Y, Z components of these, or you can use tensor components uh, to decompose that. But this ASO is then the spin orbit operator, but please do not use this operator for computing. How can we get these symmetry selection rules? We know 
that the spin orbit Hamiltonian is a scalar operator, so it's totally symmetric. We can get more detailed um, selection rules if we think of that these are compound tensor operators. So the spin part is a first rank tensor, the space part is a first rank tensor, and the result of that is that the angular momentum does not have diagonal elements if you have spatially non-degenerate wave function. That also means our spin orbit coupling operator is zero if the spatial part of the singlet wave function and the spatial part of the triplet wave function is identical. Then spin orbit coupling is forbidden. Um, we can have here, so to say, uh, calculate in which case the spin orbit coupling is allowed. We have to make the direct product of the irreducible representation of the spin and space functions. And you might wonder how the spin functions transform under the symmetry operations of a molecular point group. Here in this case, we do not need these double groups. We just can go to our normal point groups because singlet and triplets um, transform under the, the um, rotations in space just like the rotation operators. You can see that here. Here you have the uh, C2V example. You have here the transformation of the rotational operators and you see that the angular momentum operators and also the spin momentum operators, they just transform like the normal rotations. And the singlet state is always uh, totally symmetric and the triplet components transform just like the rotation operators. So the Z component of a triplet transforms like a rotation about Z and so on and so on. And these are the components um, of the triplet in terms of alpha beta um, components. Hmm? So you see in a, in a C2V symmetric molecule you do not have MS equals plus minus one components. You, ju you just have linear combinations of these and um, so you have to work with that. Okay. So, when, when we look at first and second order magnetic interactions, I already told you that if a singlet excited state exhibits exactly the same spatial configuration as the triplet state, then the spin orbit coupling is zero. And this means for your charge transfer states, if you do not have local excitations mixing into the triplet or singlet state, you will not have spin orbit coupling between, not, not direct spin orbit coupling between the singlet charge transfer state and the triplet charge transfer state. However, you can get interactions from indirect terms. This is very close to what um, Tom was talking this morning about. So you have different ways to compound this. So here you can have an intermediate state, in this case Tn. So what I have formulated here is um, an intermediate triplet state interacting um, vibronically or non-adiabatically with the T1 state. And this intermediate triplet state then couples via spin orbit coupling to your S1 state. Or the same can work also for an intermediate singlet state. It's just rarely that there is a close by intermediate singlet state. So the other case is you, you meet that more often. And of course, you can also have higher order spin orbit coupling. So you can have second order spin orbit coupling where the triplet 
couples via spin orbit to another triplet, and this triplet couples to a singlet, and then there is electronic spin spin interaction, hyperfine interaction, but these are much, much smaller normally than these terms. So we have to check what do we have here when we want to evaluate our spin orbit coupling matrix element practically. I already showed you the spin orbit, uh, the, the multi-reference um, configuration interaction expansion. So you just have here one expansion for your state A, say the singlet state, and one expansion for your triplet state, and then it's very easy. You can just um, calculate, so to say, the, your spin orbit coupling term by term, even if uh, the first term is zero, you can have these cross terms and so on and so on. So these are replacements. This is the ground state, say, determinant, your Fock determinant with A, B, C, D occupied. This is a single replacement where I have taken one electron out of orbital A, put it into R, and so on. And then to calculate the spin orbit coupling, you just proceed in this way. You couple the single excitations to your ground state wave function, and so on and so on. So, in this sum, as I said, matrix elements between configurations with equal spatial occupation, namely that diagonal terms, vanish. You get large interactions for singly excited states, or they may contribute in principle. For the doubly excited states, they vanish unless you include the full two electron spin orbit coupling. So the single excitations make the largest contributions in this case. Hmm? And you can do this for all. Um, electronic structure method which use uh, some um, expansion into, uh, into configuration. What do you do um, here in CAS SCF or RAS SCF type equations? It works similarly, but you do not have the same orbitals for your singlet and for your triplet. In that case, you just have to make sure that you choose your spaces, your inactive, active, and external spaces, such that they are equal in your singlet and in your triplet calculation. Otherwise, you cannot compute singlet triplet for CAS SCF and CAS PT2. Um, and what you can do that for coupled cluster, I just give you the reference uh, here to, to one thing. Uh, there has been uh, work by Caroline, who is also in the audience, um, on uh, ADC uh, methods. And what I will show you here briefly is that you can do the same for TDDFT amplitudes. So you can construct an approximate uh, wave function from your TDDFT amplitude and calculate uh, with this approximate wave function uh, spin orbit matrix elements, and if you look at that, this is not including charge transfer state, I must admit, but you see that in this case, if you use here TDDFT with B3LYP, you get the right good correlation with a correlation coefficient here of <coughs> 0.96. You have some outliers here for highly excited state, for large matrix elements, but um, you get a quite good um, correlation here between your uh, spin orbit matrix elements calculated from time dependent density functional theory and from uh, multi reference uh, CI wave function. So, from that, you see the same for CI singles. 
And you see, for CI singles, you cannot use. Huh? It's just like a uh, uh, heaven full of stars here. So uh, this is not, not really usable. This is for a multi-reference uh, MP2, which is uh, fine again. So what we conclude from that is that spin-orbit matrix elements from this DFT-MRCI approach have very good uh, agreement with ab initio results, again. Uh, however, this CASA-CF MRCI is not really practical for large molecules. We can uh, use time-dependent DFT for this. And it seems that spin-orbit matrix elements are much less sensitive in this case than the energies are. Um, you can use them here uh, quite well in this respect. Um, with respect to inter-system crossing, this comes in the next talk. And if you don't mind, I mean, we can have, of course, questions. I would then continue with the second part and then and discuss then at the end.